Yeah, so basically I want to talk about a little bit about um, uh, well, data policy with the focus on surveillance policy based on a project that we've been doing at Cardiff University where I'm usually working in the UK. I've now been for a couple of months at uh, University of Toronto um, as a visiting scholar, so that's been very nice to be back in Canada after I've been at, I was at McGill for a while a few years ago. But <coughs> now I'm on the other side of the ocean. So basically, um, <coughs> just to jump right into it, well, as we probably all know, the Snowden revelations four years ago um, changed our understanding, I think, quite a bit of surveillance and of datafication, <coughs> especially by pro uh, providing proof of mass data collection and analysis. That has led to some protests, although not a lot, um, some political repercussions. Here we see the then president of Brazil um, <coughs> at the UN General Assembly, uh, where she was um, a bit angry about Americans and the Brits and others spying on her and <coughs> Brazilian companies and so on. We've seen some um, activity in the business sector. We've probably all heard about the last year, about especially the, uh, the struggle between <coughs> Apple and the FBI but um, in, the, in the business sector industry has, has been one of the vocal voices to, to push against um, uh, surveillance. Uh, and there have been quite a few campaigns for policy reform. For example, here a, kind of a, a coalition of NGOs uh, in the UK called Don't Spy on Us. And <coughs> a particular target for this has been um, the UK. Because I mean, for in, in some ways, like yeah, Snowden worked for the NSA in some ways, so the NSA was a was a focus there. But um, uh, the GCHQ, the British Secret Service, certainly also um, with programs such as this one, Tempora, uh, where they really siphoned off all the data that goes through the big backbone cables, and <coughs> and actually, Reporters Sans Frontieres, Reporters Without Borders, at some point called. GCHQ, the world's biggest data monitoring system. Not the Chinese government, not the NSA, but the British GCHQ. So um, what was the situation policy-wise in the UK at that time, at that time around Snowden? Well, there was this jigsaw puzzle of different laws that each addressed different uh, specific aspects and practices, but not in a very coherent and transparent fashion. And some of them included very obscure articles that allowed widespread data collection and spying on the population. Wow, suddenly the room fills up. <laughs> <laughs> Wonderful. <laughs> um, <coughs> the effects of the Snowden revelations were <coughs> uh, that several institutional reviews were, were created um, or were called for in the UK, some of them by government, some of them others <coughs> reviews by the uh, Intelligence and Security Committee of Parliament or the Independent Surveillance Review of the Royal United Services Institute uh, or the Independent Review of Terrorism Legislation. And, and they all criticized in one way or another the, the existing legal framework and demanded a more robust uh, democratic debate especially and democratic control. Uh, one of them called for a democratic license for the surveillance activities of intelligence agencies. Um, there were also <coughs> Um, legal challenges, especially by civil society groups before the European Court of Human Rights and before the British Investigatory Powers Tribunal and others uh, that actually declared parts of the British surveillance regime illegal. And then all this uh, forced the UK government to rethink surveillance laws and regulations. And in response to these dynamics, they um, developed a new, new draft legislation at that point, the Investigatory Powers Bill, that regulates um, a wide range of surveillance practices, um, putting it all in one law. And that was then adopted uh, at the end of 2016 and became <coughs> um, the Investigatory Powers Act. So that's all a very interesting situation from the perspective of, of policy studies um, as it affects a number of conditions that are typically re uh, relevant and discuss for policy change and policy reform. Um, Snowden created a policy window, uh, as it was <coughs> uh, called a few, uh, already a few decades ago, a temporary opening for policy change in the event of a crisis or yeah, then also perhaps leading to a disunity among leading pol political forces, a window of opportunity where um, stable configurations of policy making, policy monopolies are weakened or opened up, um, potentially, <coughs> where ideas and ideologies that underpin <coughs> policy development are potentially shifting, 
um, all that happening in a context where policy is increasingly affected by multiple processes, as, as Mark Raboy called it, a complex ecology of interdependent structures with a vast array of formal and informal mechanisms working across a multiplicity of sites, so a very complex mechanism of policy making um, <coughs> with a group I'm sorry, with a growing role for non-state actors in, in multi-stakeholder processes and also for social movements and civil society actors uh, in affecting policy change. And so with Snowden creating um, a policy window and affecting these dynamics and, and in a context in which civil society and digital rights groups can impact policy development, um, it would be interesting then to see what happens and what happened in the UK and that's uh, what we were trying to look at as part of a larger project that we conducted in Cardiff and with some collaborators elsewhere, and that was for Digital Citizenship and Surveillance Society. Um, and the idea was to analyze implications of the Snowden revelations on uh, media coverage, on public knowledge and activism, on the legal and regulatory framework, and on technological standards and infrastructures. And you can find the results and publications uh, that came out of this project on this website, dcssproject.net. There are also some of them also uh, open, <coughs> open access, most of them. Um, uh, but here, what I want to do is really to focus on the part that looked at policy development, at basically that aspect of law and regulation, one of these uh, work streams that we have. And what we did there was, or what I mainly want to talk about here is, are some insights from, from the interviews that we conducted, a set of um, semi-structured interviews with policy stakeholders and experts from a variety of stakeholder communities, members of parliament and other um, policy makers, people from security agencies, from, from also from yeah, police, um, from industry, from civil society, and from the review and oversight um, community. And what we wanted to find out really was um, to understand a little bit more the, the different perspectives on the post-Snowden policy development and on key issues that were under debate then, especially during the past, during the year of 2016 and, the, and the, during the process when the investigatory powers <coughs> bill was developed, um, and the different roles by stakeholder groups in this and the degree of their influence on policy development, on developing this new massive big law that, that came into effect then at the end of last year. So um, a few brief glimpses into some of these findings. First of all, controversies of a policy reform. They start really with the definition of surveillance, and that's um, not, not unusual, I guess. But most interviewees that we, we asked um, thought that data collection really is already a kind of surveillance. But um, security agencies, of course, but also a minority of interviewees from politics and from industry uh, said that it becomes surveillance only at the point of analysis. And particularly, they said, when a human, when somebody, uh, for example, reads the email that is, that is collected and these kind of things. So there was kind of a curious focus on human analysts. Um, very little reference to algorithmic profiling, automated searches, and so on, especially from politics, from security agencies, and so on. Uh, but it shows already that um, there is no consensus, there was no consensus of the very, on the very basis of that new law. The key controversy in the UK at that time, and I guess generally after Snowden, has been on uh, the question of mass or bulk collection of data, especially then in, with the UK and the, the practices of tempora and so on. Law enforcement said, of course, uh, it's necessary to investigate crime, but most civil society and also industry uh, were, yeah, you can see the quotes here, were absolutely opposed uh, to that uh, very practice. Interestingly, targeted collection was seen also by civil society groups um, often as less intrusive, and there was very little debate also in our interviews with, um, or a little response in our interviews with, uh, with civil society and digital rights groups um, on who would actually be targeted in the current political climate and whether that is so much better than mass collection, but that's kind of a side issue. Um, the public debate at that time was very much about encryption. This I'm coming back actually now. Um, surprisingly, actually, it was the issue of least disagreement among all these different groups and stakeholders. Um, all actually highlighted the importance of strong encryption, including all politicians, including people from security agencies and um, the security sector. But we felt like it was a bit that actually law enforcement's 
main and, and the security sector's main motivation there was um, um, that uh, where am I? That they didn't want to have a wider public debate about this. They were afraid of the backlash that we've seen with uh, services like WhatsApp moving towards encryption or uh, groups like ISIS supposedly creating their own um, uh, encryption. Uh, they wanted to uh, avoid that, of course. Um, mm -hmm. State-sponsored hacking, which is sometimes called equipment interference or computer network exploitation and so on, was a key emerging debate. Um, uh, it was it is an increasingly prominent method of, of surveillance. It, it was called by many the future of, of what is happening in the surveillance sector. But of course, it's particularly problematic, especially um, with bulk hacking, with, with wider with ways to not, not just get into one uh, machine, but into a wider set of uh, machines. Uh, the serious consequences in the context of the Internet of Things, wearables, smart homes, smart cars, and so on. We can imagine that. Um, it was described as absurd and dangerous by, by people from civil society. At the same time, someone from the National Crime Agency um, uh, said, we're getting quite excited about the Internet of Things. And so, um, again, very different, different views about this. What about the role of different actors? Um, of course, Snowden's role in triggering policy reform was widely uh, accepted and, and, and agreed, also in triggering um, the more critical perspective by by industry, as I just put a few quotes up here, I'm not going to read them all. Um, parliamentarians and classic lawmakers um, were not so influential in a way that they lacked, typically lacked detailed, they said themselves, they lacked uh, detailed understanding of the issues. Many of those interested in social justice issues often prioritized other themes, environmental issues, housing, health, and so on. And of course, they were all under the influence of the national security discourse, especially after terrorist attacks. And so there was little opposition or resistance. Civil society groups then um, fulfilled that watchdog function that parliament should usually hold. Uh, they were quite vocal in, in opposition to the law and were recognized as a legal, uh, as, a, as a legitimate actor with um, relevant expertise, as you can see in the quote uh, over here. Um, but while they focused on lobbying government, they didn't really manage to raise um, wider popular opposition. Um, uh, and there was no, yeah, there were no mass demonstrations, and this was pointed out repeatedly also by policymakers and by uh, people from security agencies who said basically the people don't care, so we'll just go ahead with our plans. Um, Tech business, as I said, was another strong voice of criticism against the expansion of surveillance capabilities. But then security and intelligence agencies um, were much more involved than these uh, other actors in policy development from the outset. They were asked first about their needs and all that. Uh, and so they were able to shape legislation in more detail. They enjoyed the closest access to policymakers. They also benefited from this institutional arrangement that placed the home office uh, that is that is, that is uh, responsible for national security uh, at the center of policy reform rather than, say, a ministry of, of justice or, or something like that. Uh, and so there were different levels of access and, and institutional settings that played a significant role in the shaping of policy reform. Just very briefly, uh, what about this call in, these, in the um, uh, studies at the beginning that I mentioned at the beginning about a democratic license, about a sufficient public debate? Most of our interviews, uh, interviewees said a true public debate has not yet taken place, uh, whereas, of course, the security officers said, well, the public should trust us, and that's it. Um, the main purpose of the new law, many felt, was to legitimize existing behavior rather than uh, to enter into a debate about what should be done. Um, and there are a couple of other quotes here on the slide. Um, several of our interviewees also um, felt that um, this whole process of developing new surveillance policy should start from the other end, not about what is, what is useful and, and uh, necessary for the security agencies, but um, from what is what is important and secure, uh, what what does human security mean? How should we start it from citizen perspective? Flip the switch from state to citizen centric thinking. Uh, so basically, in conclusion, um, we see diametrically opposed views on what surveillance policy should look like. Um, and despite the policy window created by Snowden, there was no wider public debate uh, in the UK at that at that time. Um, security agencies benefited from favorable institutional arrangements. Um, they had direct access to power, 
and uh, and also they've benefited from the predominant of, of course of a of a national security discourse and so we might say the inability of digital rights groups to actually uh, mobilize wider uh, awareness and develop a counter discourse um, so the struggle over data governance in this sense was won um, by the agencies and their allies in the UK uh, Home Office um, against strong opposition by more or less all other stakeholders. Maybe an important lesson for progressive policy development from this could be um, that public opposition, awareness, protests and so on is very necessary and um, <coughs> that balanced institutional settings are, are necessary. And that's it very briefly. Thank you. As you can see by the title, we went a bit rogue here, but the <laughs> uh, basic idea is that to try to keep that under 15 minutes, 20, I, I understand if we're nice, um, just trying to get hold here. Uh, Mark here uh, and I are working on uh, governmentality, uh, big data, and I industrialization process, because this is what all about, you know, automation, big uh, volume. So today we're going to focus on one dimension of, of those research, which is individuation and subject subjectivation. Well, that's a tongue twister. Uh, just to give you a bit of epistemology where we stand uh, uh, in our, our interpretation or our analysis, I should say. Uh, we have an Heideggerian perspective, meaning that being is what reproduces itself in time. So it's not going to be static. It's going to be about uh, diachronic uh, processes. Uh, I'm also a big fan of Simondon, so also being is a, just a phase of individu individuation process. So it gives uh, the perspective which uh, we will we'll, uh, board uh, our subject. Uh, and of course, a bit of Foucault uh, about power, knowledge, truth, and subjectivation, and uh, governmentality. Basically, we see society as a reproduction uh, dynamics, or some may say dialectics, uh, where agent and institution are both producer and product. That's the whole idea here. The cat does not get out of the bag. Mm. So uh, we have uh, one of our uh, great sociologists uh, in the French world, and uh, is Michel Freitag, who uh, unfortunately uh, left us too soon. Uh, Freitag's work is all about uh, social reproduction based on symbolic interaction, which is going to be really handful for analysis of the big data circus. I'm sorry, my PhD students just went by and tried to make a fool of myself. <laughs> uh, for Freitag, there is several uh, formal modes of social reproduction. One is cultural, symbolical, the myth. Another one is political, institutional, the law, whether divine or uh, the modern uh, democracy law. And the third one, which we felt we are in right now, is the lack, or uh, what Zizek would call the lack of symbolical efficiency the decline of transcendental values, a profit of a decisional, operational, pragmatic uh, mode. So that's the, the framework where we're going to go. So uh, it, it also it always poses a problem: how do you synchronically analyze a diachronical uh, diachronic process? So we're going to start with the subject as producer, and we're going to end up the whole circuit by that same subject being also produced, and thus uh, big data individuation and subjectivity. Uh, we started our work, uh, when we started a research group about 10 years ago, we started with the concept of hyper-individualism, which is basically the neoliberal subject of being uh, free of ideology, free, it's the end of the, the leotard, end of the grand narrative. So you have a subject that basically uh, does not receive uh, his identity by the institution, but claims his free will to create. And if you, you look at social media, all the uh, identity surveys, quests, self-expression, and even the selfie. Uh, you know, for me, the selfie is, uh, you're late, guys. <laughs> <laughs> you got to keep that shoe right up on right a good place here. <laughs> so it is an... I mean, iTunes, you know, iPad, me.com. I mean, it's no fun to do sociology when it's that explicit. Mm. But <laughs> so I'm going to start with the hyper individualistic. So if I don't receive my identity, I need to construct it, one, and to show it. And there's a very interesting processes going on with the social media. 
because when they say, oh, it's just narcissistic, uh, when you have 80% of, of a population that is all narcissistic, you're not in psychology anymore, you're in sociology. Uh, it opens another research. Uh, are they social pathologies? Uh, we're not touching. We have colleagues who are working on that, but it's not our, our uh, cup of tea. Okay, so basically, uh, Mark, being an economist, it's not his fault. And uh, mm. we, <laughs> we started with the uh, political economy of the, the merchandising circuit of personal data with uh, uh, social media. So, uh, you have the subject. Yay. The interface, interface device and the multiplication of uh, input Woo. devices. And notice in the past 50 or 60 years, we went from time sharing to I'm working a freaking bracelet, which is mine, an extension of my body. So uh, again, even in technology, the, uh, the individualization is pursuing. So uh, there is also a over symbolization of many aspects of life. Uh, some may say all aspects of life. And uh, you brought the Internet of Object. It's funny because we're, we're preparing your book on that. And it's, it's strange how the uh, computer-wise, their distinction is online world and physical world. When you, you put the two together, you've got the totality. And this is what's lurking into the horizon. So the thing is, uh, these technology, and I draw on the works of Bernard Stiegler, who is also a fan of Simon Don and uh, Heidegger. For Stiegler, he is also a, a fan of uh, Le Roi Gourin, the French anthropologist, so the tool as a memory. And you see this <coughs> with the technologies. And, th and that's the, the crust of the biscuit, for it, because everything you do, it, it's retained in, in, the, in the machine, in the interface. So it, it creates data to be shared or not. Uh, so. Let's start with uh, an example. I like this watch. Now, uh, it's a symbolical production. It leaves traces. And now that's, it's going to be, I like. Now, notice that I may like the watch because it reminds me of my father. The price is good, or I like the company. The first process is going to be one of decontextualization and de-affectation. And it's going to be brought back to its cybernetical uh, it I know, uh, me measure the behavior. <laughs> what have you done? You've clicked on this. And it resumes the meaning to that. The behavior and the preferences, which will become, after processing, correlation, well, the prediction, of course, uh, which is a proper of uh, big data. And let us not forget, like uh, Rouvois says, uh, it's, it's prediction, yes, but big data is also used prediction to justify intervention at the present time. So. Let's not forget that. Uh, also, uh, here is where uh, uh, there, there is creation of market value, which is the profile. Okay? So he clicked, so he must like this. So it's basically, uh, well, actually, it was our, our, our guest speaker's uh, Paul Edwards book, Closed World, we call uh, cybernetic behaviorism. We have an illustration there uh, right off the bat. And, uh, and the profile, this is what is the, the market value here. It's also a reminiscence of its origin, which is the military application. Uh, God knows the marketing of these days, uh, technology-wise, was all uh, prepaid and preset in Iraq in the, the two Gulf Wars. So the profile here is the, is the same thing. You, you get the data, you get the network, and you have a profile, and this is where the money maker is. Another interesting point is that uh, I'm not sure if it's the English word okay, it's indexation. It's all about uh, the, the symbolical becomes natural, uh, and the metaphor of the trace. You do something, it's, there's a trace and it's neutral. And this is where we get the illusion of raw data. And suddenly the real, and look how it fits into Freytag's frame of mind. I don't need symbolical transcendency or collectiveness to grasp the real. It is present by itself, like it was a natural resource. So the problem is, if you're, you're not agreeing with the real, you're in deep shit. And that makes you sick or a terrorist. And this is why, if you notice that the history of those technology, the society of control or the terrorism, <coughs> it goes pair to pair. I remind you that in the 1990s, the Pentagon was submitting for massive database, which is we call big data, and they wanted some uh, uh, submission for 100 million uh, entries to, to, to uh, manage population. And all of a sudden, 
we're not we're no longer in any war, we're in domestic security. Uh, so that's another thing. So uh, like the, the philosopher Alain says, the problem with truth is that uh, some uh, actually f find it. <laughs> so we gotta be aware of that. But there is certainly a um, mistrust of the institutional, the transcendent, because hey, it's all politics. And we all know now technology supposedly occults the politics. So there is a information in its original sense of bringing to form the profile. And market-wise, it is to pair the pairing of demand and supply. So I like that watch. Now, here is where the ideology, ah, oh, only ten, 10 minutes to go, I'm free, good. <laughs> uh, this is uh, me this morning. Uh, now, mm -hmm. why would I, I like the watch? It could be that I like fancy watches. It could be I like old stuff, so. It could also be I'm old myself and I need some supplements. <laughs> I mean, there are many reasons that, uh, and this is where you see, try to kick the symbolical out of the barn. It will find a way to creep back in. It does. So, uh, well, you see, when you go into this, you say, okay, it's interpretation, it's relatively slack, but let's go when it's data, pure data or numbers. And this is a metaphor that you will see more and more, the control board, the dash, which is basically about Ultra, it's, it's, uh, in many ways, it's the uh, Heideggerian nightmare where man confuses his own destiny with the, uh, those of technique, which is to plow, reveal things. And even uh, friendship is now something that you could put a digital uh, numerical value on it. And here, uh, as you can see, uh, we're talking about, uh, this is an old concept from uh, Henri Lefebvre in the old days, about communication <coughs> being more about signal. Uh, I refer to you, uh, Maurizio Lazzarato, he had, about the semio uh, machine like semiotics. And this is where the, you see the cybernetic uh, ideology uh, de being deployed. The thing is, here, the construction of the subject, because this is supposed to be my digital double, but it's a profiling. And if I agree, I say, yes, this is me. And you, this is typically also to Foucault, an action all on action. Okay, so do you like this? And you can see this, it's being real time, it's being about self-expression, it's being about numbers, technique, rather than transcendental values. In other words, you are being, we have a subjectivation of an agent being produced. Here it says, click on this. Red, go. Uh, don't go, sorry. <laughs> don't worry, he's doing the driving. So, uh, but you, you see the basic idea here. It's really, uh, Stiglitz calls it the, the compulsion economy because it's about real time, it's about jouissance in terms of uh, that kind of gratification, about being right here, right now. So, communication is becoming more and more monosemic. Eat less, more calories. I was at a uh, I'm, I'm, I'm uh, finishing here. I was at a uh, PhD uh, uh, defense, and uh, it's about big data in the suicide prevention. And the jury were all about, oh, it's so great, big data. And the student was, oh, well, you know, there's certainly some surveillance issues and false positive and all that. No, no, no. It's a, we don't, we don't uh, suspect bad people. You know, we apply to good. And I said, well, tell that to the 40 mourners of the Pakistan wedding, uh, wedding that were shot by a drone. Uh, but the funny thing is two members of the jury had an Apple Watch. And I asked them, oh, you got an Apple Watch. Oh, it's so fun. It tells me when to do stuff, when to walk. And those are official psychologists. <laughs> and I thought, wow. <laughs> so I did ring a bell, but there was no smart. Uh. <laughs> so this is what we call the uh, machine-like or machine-like semiotics. And, and, and as you can see, I start with a hyper-individualistic meaning expressing about myself here, now, real time. Uh, it's all about numbers, it's all about uh, supposedly apolitical, and going back, it produces a system, it participates, and then the system recreates uh, that same subject. I'm giving you real data, real time, do your choice. And the idea is that this keeps on rolling and rolling. Uh, 
There's another point, it's also in real time, and uh, the other part of our presentation, somewhere, uh, sometime uh, elsewhere, uh, it's about social acceleration. This is the work of uh, Hartmut Rosa, because it, it's all driven by the real time. If you were a Lacan uh, Zizek fan, you would say that about the jouissance. You know, why do I pirate movie? Because I want to hear it now. Uh, the, 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 the idea of uh, the moment the, the record industry recognized they had a new type of consumer and started selling online, you don't hear about piracy anymore. So, uh, I guess we're, uh, I mean, we're on time. Mm -hmm. Oh, that's a first for me. Uh, thank you very much. That's about the, the whole thing. I apologize. It was a bit crap and fast. We tried to make it down, but it's a, a bit more elaborate in the, uh, in, the, in the corners there. So, thank you. Mm -hmm. Hi. So I feel I sh like I shouldn't admit this, but I work in a psychology department. <laughs> <laughs> Where's your watch? Yeah. Exactly. <laughs> um, but yes, uh, hi everyone. My name is Emily. Uh, I'm from the University of Bath, which if you don't know, is a couple hours west of London in the UK. And in case you're feeling confused right now, I am from Vancouver. So <laughs> the accent is very mixed up and we'll see where it goes. But I work there in psychology in the Institute for <coughs> Policy Research with Julie Barnett and Hannah Durant. All right, so I very specifically named my talk Beyond the Hype because I think we hear an awful lot about this ideology of data as almost like a savior, particularly in the UK and other developing countries. So this quote, I think, sort of exemplifies that very well. So this was a few months ago. Our chief executive of the civil service, John Manzoni, who was ironically at a conference about data, said that data is at the heart of 21st century government. It puts the citizen front and center in public service delivery. It powers effective decision making on the front line. And it makes government work for everyone by better reflecting the world that we live in. So as I said, a lot is put on data. And data science and big data are positioned as these sort of pillars of current and future government innovation. But as any of us know, in any kind of critical data science, this is not often the case. Data is not all good. It's not entirely positive, and there can be bad and poor and even illegal data processes and projects. But talking about those projects is challenging. We do not hear grandiose speeches about how we did something wrong, and now we're going to do it better. We hear about these amazing, innovative examples of how this is how everyone should be working. So, how can we move beyond that hike? How can we explore data processes in government that take account of these day-to-day -day realities of data use and analysis, and taking into consideration the fact that failure is just flat out a bad word in policy? We're not going to say we failed. We'll say we had a learning experience. Or we'll couch it in another example that went really well and just put a sentence about this bad thing that happened. So how do we incorporate elements of criticality and reflexivity in particularly local government data processes where they don't necessarily have the funding to put on these huge innovative examples. So one method that comes out of psychology <laughs> that I started exploring for answering these sorts of questions was story completion. So this is a prompt-based qualitative method traditionally used in psychology. It was popularized by Braun and Clark a few years back and based <coughs> on work of other social psychologists Kitchinger and Powell in the 90s. And it's a very simple method. It's a qualitative exploratory method where you offer a short story tem stem, sorry, either in first or third person. You ask participants to complete the story in a set amount of time or at a set length, collate and collect the stories, and then apply any range of qualitative techniques, ideally thematic discourse narrative techniques, those sorts of things. To give an example of how other people have used it, so Clark and Brown, a couple years ago, did an exploration of views on same-sex infidelity. So they offered this story, and sorry, it's a little fuzzy, but I'll read the first one. It says, Sarah wakes up early on Tuesday morning and follows her usual routine of getting ready for work while John, her husband of four years, remains sleeping. Later that day, Sarah returns home early from work. As she enters the house, she notices John's coat and work shoes in the hallway. Thinking he must have come home from work sick, she walks upstairs to their bedroom where she opens the door. She's confronted with John in bed with another man. Dot, dot, dot. So these are quite dramatic examples. And the idea of stories like this is that we're looking not exactly at personal experience, but perceptions and projections. So how do people imagine these situations happening? And ideally, this will give access to a wide range of responses, including socially undesirable ones. So 
So it's ideal for sensitive topics like sex offenders, body perception, sexuality, and in my case, the way government uses data. <laughs> uh, and what this came out of for me was some conversations with our local government who said, sure, you can come in and interview us about how we use data, but no one's going to tell you the truth of something that went badly. No one's going to express examples where maybe they did something less than ethical because their you know, hand is going to be held to the flame. And on a practical side, this is a relatively quick method. It can incorporate a range of structures. So you can have comparative stories, different genders, different ideologies. So the overview of this study that this story completion task was put in was to identify perceived catalyst limiting factors and the utility of new forms of data in policy development in local UK government. So we did the story completion with a pilot of 10 participants, so it was a very small study, alongside some more traditional case-based semi-structured interviews. All participants were from the local area, they were data scientists, data providers, uh, service managers, and they were provided with, as I said, a short story stem and asked to take as little or much time as they wanted to complete the story by hand. All right, so here's the story that we provided. It's a little less sexy than the last one. So Sam is a local community organization manager. She wants to understand how to gain access to local council data about people who use her organization's services. She heard that there were local people in the council who she could contact. What does Sam do next? So it's a very basic story. This isn't asking for complex data analytics. And the reason we chose such a basic example of data sharing was because we were talking to non-experts, non-data scientists, alongside data scientists, and we wanted to make sure everyone could answer the story to begin with to see how it worked. So couched within that larger study, what I really wanted to see is how do participants imagine these hypothetical data sharing projects? Does this reflect the status quo of data projects in government? And is story completion a viable method to use to understand policy and data processes? So let's look at a few of these emerging themes with a big caveat that none of these have reached sort of complete saturation. So they're very early. It's very much a pilot. So open for discussion on what you think about them. So the first theme was the importance of a personal connection in data sharing. So one participant said, get sympathetic people, organize people, develop relationships, find other like organizations. And I think what this sort of underpins that data access is not just knowing what data you need, how to do it. It's not just a series of processes. It's about knowing the people and having a relationship. And they suggested in their stories that having that personal relationship would lead to a more likely positive outcome of gaining the data. Quite similar to that, the second theme was aligning organizational and individual priorities, which I thought was quite interesting. So even moving beyond having that personal relationship, they suggested that you would not gain access to data unless it fit within what that government wanted you to do with it. So if this was going to go counter the government interest, which makes sense, you're never going to get access to data about your organization. So some people said that why question is important and critical to determine. Uh, find people who can champion the idea of open data, develop a common vision, or check whether this data access request fit with priority projects. All right. This one I thought was quite interesting. So the third theme I found was that considering alternative ways of accessing data. So this was almost a rejection of the idea of coming to people who were ostensibly data providers in the local community. And they said, please just go anywhere else first. This is too much trouble for us. <laughs> So someone said, check online, maybe there's already available information published, look at national data, submit a freedom of information request, essentially do anything first in these stories before coming to us without, because there's no guarantee of a positive outcome, there's no guarantee you'll get data from us. And somewhat related to moving past in the stories, once we got through that personal relationships and developing these common visions, people talked about ethical access and data handling, which is quite a prosaic process, you know. A lot of people mentioned information governments, make sure data protection issues have been correctly handled, anonymize the data. What I thought was quite interesting is that no one told a story about what ethics meant. They just told, sort of referred to information governance. They referred to checklists. They didn't talk about, is this a good idea? Is this a project that people would agree with? They mostly talked about how they could fit those sort of tick boxes in. And then this is sort of a final and very overarching theme. So, because there's only 10 stories, there wasn't really a clear narrative of how these stories ended. But what a lot of people did was they described and highlighted these complexities in data flows. So some people questioned whether there was be avail any sort of useful data available, whether or not Sam would need help in accessing the data, 
uh, whether their protocols were in place, and these are not necessarily the best quotes to represent this, but essentially all these stories told different ways. So no one had a consistent narrative of how this data access process would look. And something that didn't quite reach a full theme, but is very related to that theme, is that people question the value or the likelihood of an outcome flat out. So some people said, we don't tend to follow up. The skills required to work with the data may not even be there. Maybe Sam would get access to her data, those sorts of things. And I think it kind of highlights the importance of a methodology that goes beyond just an interview, because people didn't end their stories well. They didn't end it happy go, and then Sam does this, and she gets access to data. They said, probably wouldn't happen. <laughs> and so I don't think you would get that in a normal sort of structured conversation. And here is you know, classic word cloud of what the story said. Data, Sam, need, and counsel. And I think one big caveat to mention that should be fairly obvious <coughs> is that these uh, stories are very context and stem specific. So what you put in is what you're going to get out. I asked for a story about Sam sharing data. I got a story about Sam maybe getting access to data. So this isn't going to explore things beyond the bounds of your story necessarily. But it also just highlights the importance of choosing a STEM that suit, suits your research question. And I think I'm quite interested in moving into a phase of co-design of these stories. So how do we create a story STEM with local government and then get them to apply to other government people and to see how those stories become out? And I think what's interesting too is that story completion injects this possibility of creativity into data mm. discussions, something that we don't see a lot in qualitative methodologies. I'm not just sitting people down and saying, talk to me for an hour. I did do that, but <laughs> I'm also asking them to sort of like engage with their creative faculties to discuss how they think data processing works. And it's only through exploring both these failures and these successes, these different kinds of stories, that we can build on the status quo, create more robust and transparent government data pro uh, practices in the future. And moving on from this, I want to do a validation. I want to explore different stories using larger studies and contexts. And I have these semi-structured interviews, and I'm going to compare themes that come out of that and themes from this to see if they're the same, they're different, where these contrast. And I think most important, and coming out of listening a lot about data visualization, is how do I present this data back to government? So I can do all this and say, this is what you're doing right, this is what you're doing wrong, this is some things you're telling me about how things are going, but I'm not sure quite <laughs> how to put that into action and to create a process of feedback that causes uh, genuine change. So thank you very much. Please feel free to tweet me or email me. Thank you. Thank you. Uh, the problem of information and its relation to democracy and to power is far from new. By information I mean what publics know, don't know, don't know they don't know, ought to know, can know, and how they come to know it. The belief, according to democratic romanticists, was that if democracy was to be an effective system, it required, at the very least, informed citizens to make rational decisions. This meant more than merely headstrong individuals. It required a whole constellation of institutional supports, including electoral systems, political parties, basic civil rights to speech, expression, belief, and association, the development of a free press, public education systems, and advanced research. With the rise of digital information technologies, computation, and planetary systems of communication, there was hope that this knowledge might be resolved. That this sort of this knowledge problem might be resolved. Unfortunately, far from solving the problem of knowledge, the contemporary moment has forced defenders of democracy around the world to confront a rather unexpected paradox of information overload. That is, at the very moment we have the capacity to inform ourselves as never before, we are simultaneously and sort of deceptively confronted with the impossibility of ever being completely informed. By simultaneously, I refer to a dynamic by which the sort of compulsion to collect information in order to know more leads to uncertainty as the amount of information to consider increasing and a nagging doubt that can extend into a sort of paralysis takes over. The only answer is, of course, to have more information, more simulation, more analysis. So in this way, information overload is simultaneously both too much and not enough information. And by deceptive, I mean to suggest that at the moment of paralysis, um, has been taken advantage of those by those with wealth, influence, and power to employ bad faith science and effective politics uh -oh. to attack and undermine knowledge and criticism inconvenient to the agenda. So what to take from this? What to take from this frame? Well, I think I argue in a lot of ways here that 
to some great extent, what we have to understand is information is a power relation. Sorry, I'm having trouble here. Public sphere institutions. So let me just. So in a lot of ways, my argument to what to ex what extent? I would say to some great extent, information is a power relation. Okay, so public sphere institutions, along with the Enlightenment subject, seem to be failing all around us. I argue this is because of two key reasons. And you can see the sort of slides behind me showing dramatically declining faith in public sphere institutions of all sorts over the last 40 years. I can talk about those more in questions if you want, but I'm not going to talk about them here except to sort of show them. So I argue that this is because of two reasons. Why are we seeing this collapse? One, the democratic potential of information technology, scientific inquiry, and robust public sphere have a capacity to challenge ontological assertions made by those in power. So in other words, information can be a threat to power and one that can't easily be dismissed. Post-truth, fake news, alternative facts, these words are all suggested of two complementary options to the powerful. How do they respond? To attack and undermine the legitimacy of public sphere institutions? and to provide alternative data and alternative narratives, narratives. So many democratic romanticists, economists, psychologists, data scientists, they work under the assumption that the enlightenment subject, a cognitive, rationalist, human, individualist subject, is the natural condition. And this condition has the capacity to consider the best information available to them to make the pos best possible decisions and act accordingly. And it implies also that the better the information and the more the information, the more likely this condition will facilitate consensus, that we will all be able to come to a, a similar decision. This is the most shocking. This is a decline in um, sort of people's desire to live in a country that's governed dem by democratically. It's plummeting. This is from, I think this is from the, uh, this is from the World Value Survey. Okay, so all of that is to say, in my, pre in my presentation today, and what you're seeing behind you, I'm showing sort of uh, from a project exploring um, the, what was called the movement, a rather confusing name for a movement, the movement in Iceland, um, emerging out of the global financial crisis, uh, and a project they had in, that was sort of aspired to address the challenge of information as a power relation that I've sort of laid out uh, through an ambitious program to sort of build a data haven and reinvigorate the Icelandic public sphere. This project has, in its imagination, successes and failures much to teach those of us who are concerned with the rise of the authoritarian right, the challenge of climate change, the post-democratic turn, the role of data, and the breakdown of the public sphere. That said, and I'll get to this a little bit at the end, this project is also riddled with some pretty serious flaws. Behind me you're seeing a time lapse of, this isn't actually after the global financial crisis, but actually a time lapse of a protest <coughs> after the Panama Papers were released. So in 2008, you might not know this, Iceland was the site of a spectacular economic crash, serious social unrest in the first act of the global financial crisis that began in 2007. This came, as I showed earlier, from the collapse of three major Icelandic banks and revelations of government cover-ups and collusion, over-leveraging, and massive fraud. These revelations were published, publicized by then little-known media organization, WikiLeaks after the Icelandic government actually stepped in to prevent the Icelandic national telev television news station, RUV, from airing the, uh, the evidence of fraud to its national audience. The movement believed that this crisis in I Iceland necessitated a sort of radical rethinking of institu existing foundational institutions, including a new constitution, reform in traditional new, in, uh, traditional new media organizations, elected representation, which they wanted to shift to direct democracy and political parties, as well as rethinking sort of the role and regulation of the internet and of flows of information. Um, and it's this last bit, uh, regulating the internet and information flows that gives us the name Gimme Shelter. We established an institute, the Icelandic Modern Media Institute that was designed, that's where I get the Gimme from, uh, designed to sort of address these problems specifically. And here's a quote I have from an interview I did with Gudrun Adir, who is the current director of the Institute, and he says the objective is, quote, to create a safe haven for freedom of information and freedom of expression in Iceland, but which is also of global significance. It takes various fields of legislation, including data protection, intermediary protection, source protection, whistleblower protection, defamation law reform, 
among others. In other words, everything associated with data and communication, as well as access to information and freedom of expression, laws and freedom of speech in Iceland. That's the end of the quote. And these, this was basically meant, uh, infrastructural reforms meant to ensure transparency for the powerful, robust public debate, and a protected space for private deliberation and organization. Um, a similar sentiment was a, an animating spirit of the Icelandic party. Behind me you see one of the found, co-founders, Smari McCarthy, who was also involved in WikiLeaks. And here's a quote from him that sort of reflects much of what Idir was saying as well. Quote, when Iceland's economy collapsed, what we saw was that every single failing that caused the collapse was a lack of information flow. The regulators, the banks, the auditors, everybody through the, the chain either had insufficient information or whoever was supposed to be regulating them had insufficient information. So the entire, entire thing came to some degree understood as just a failing in information flow. And of course, if you don't have the information, you don't have accountability. And you don't have any of the safeguarding structures uh, actually functioning. So in essence, you do not have anything that is in any way akin to a democracy if you don't have information, end quote. Finally, I'll give you one more quote from another one of the interviews. Uh, this is from a founding member of the Icelandic Pirate Party and also a WikiLeaks associate, Jason Katz. Oh, wait, I got that confused. I'll get to this one. This is Gudrun Adir um, talking about the importance of his, about Emmy. And... Uh, another member of the Icelandic Pirate Party here, he says, how do you create, how do you change the world more towards a direction where, for the last 10 years, it's been moving against freedom of speech, against freedom of ideas, against people expressing themselves because they are afraid of expressing themselves the wrong way. You've got to make an example. You've got to make a pilot somewhere. How do you make a pilot out of a country? You go to a really small country and you see if it works. And if it works, that's the best evidence you can give to other people to use. So with these characterizations in mind, I sort of want to try to elaborate on how this project is designed to work. I think the best way to understand the idea is sort of a blueprint for building a socio-legal technical stack. And this represents an important step, I think, in some ways in how we understand the internet. It's not merely a horizontal network of networks, but also includes layers on top of layers of physical infrastructure, without which this global information and computational capacities would not be possible. This stack reminds us that the picture behind me, which is the sort of thing we often see to sort of represent what we think of when we think of the internet, thank you, um, is misleading. It's misleadingly flat, non-territorial, without physical representation of the internet, <coughs> okay? And in a recent book by Bratt, the stack, he describes something similar to the Icelandic project, at least in one sense. A heterogeneous, multi-layered, interoperable assemblage of physical information system of systems, unevenly distributed vertically and spatially across the planet. And what's important about Bratt's concept of the stack is the idea of information systems as physical. Databases and information infrastructures, and I should say material, databases and information infrastructures are not simply neutral, technical means of assembling and sharing data. They are not merely products that store captured data about the world, but are bundles of contingent and relational processes that do work in the world. They are complex socio-technical systems that are embedded within a larger institutional landscape of researchers, institutional institutions, legal frameworks, and sovereign states. And these constitute essential tools in the production of information, knowledge, governance, and capital. Moreover, the pirates are trying to build a counter-hegemonic stack, um, one that sort of protects from what Bratt presents as a sort of totalizing physical information and computational network of networks, and to which others have pointed to sort of a US imperialist venture to sort of control the world through control of communication systems. And just so you get a sense, uh, I mean, I, I have the stack here. In, interestingly, this is taken from a leak of, uh, this is from, a, a, I think, an NSA file leaked by Snowden. And you can see the way in which they're also considering the internet to be a stack. And you can see then the way in which the, the stack we're talking about at a very base level includes an island in the middle of the North Atlantic, um, includes protections at sort of the physical network layer that are meant to prevent sort of penetration from outside sources. Uh, includes at a higher layer levels of encryption and so on. I mean, encryption is kind of useless without other protections and moving all the way up. So it's sort of thinking of the sort of verticality of the stack, the verticality of the internet as something that needs to be protected in this sort of data fortress that they're sort of suggesting that we build. Okay, so um, as Brigitte John's daughter, leader of the pirates, puts it, uh, it's not enough to create new systems. You have to create new foundations to install new systems in. And the Pirate Project would sort of reorganize all of Iceland to be <coughs> part of this foundation. Still, there are problems, even serious problems with this plan. 
aside from the obvious, while the pirates haven't won an election yet. Uh, more deeply, though, there are structural contradictions and limitations, I think, to the socio-technical stack that are worth considering, even though they haven't necessarily won. They might never win, and even if they do win, they might not implement, because they've given us a lot to think about when it comes to how we might reorganize these things, especially, I think, in lieu of a lot of what we've heard from the rest of the panelists today. So what are these tensions? I'm just going to sort of put them out there, and if you're interested, we can talk about them more. Uh, what I've offered you here is probably the third chapter in my dissertation. The fourth and fifth are going to deal with in much more detail these tensions, but I'll just put a few of them out there. There's a tension, I think, and I think we heard this a little bit in the keynote last night, and I, unfortunately I missed the keynote this morning, but I thought it might have been there too, between expertise and direct democracy, or expertise and democracy. The internet, computation, data centers, information systems, these are all complicated things. Expertise is necessary in order to know how to intervene to address the social consequences that emerge. But this does not mesh with expertise and processes of direct democracy, where everyone is empowered, but not everyone has the technical capacity to know how to fix the internet. So this is something that uh, the pirates definitely are going to have to work out. And to go with this, there's a second tension, I think, for the pirates between leadership and process. The pirates want to reimagine the political party without strong leadership. The party, in their view, is meant to become the vehicle through which the will and desires of people flow. It's not meant to provide leadership in terms of putting forth an agenda outside of this one sort of fortress that they think they need to establish so that democracy can actually function the way it's meant to. But then once it begins to function, they don't think they need to play a role in it. Um, there's a few more. There's also uh, tension between private and uh, public. You know, they say everything public that's the state should be transparent. Everything private about the individual should be private. But they're not really sure where the corporation fits into that. And where financial organizations, which is a shame because the whole thing was launched because they didn't know what corporations and financial institutions were doing, and they think this led to the crisis. A bit, of an, a bit of an issue. And then some, just very quickly, two limitations. The first is a limitation around sovereignty. Iceland is nominally sovereign, but the relation between it and, for instance, the US are not equal. So despite the fact that they want to build a fortress like this, when the FBI needed to retrieve a server housed in one of the data centers to prosecute the Dread Pirate Roberts, they were in and out of that data center in under 30 minutes. Mm -hmm. And the, the ruling party, who actually attended the Republican uh, nomination under Trump and has long history, of course, they, want, they bent over backwards to make sure the Americans could get what they want. So there's a real issue there with the stack. And the second limitation is the one I started with. This enlightenment subject, the cognitive, rational, individualist, human subject, is not the natural condition. More information and more data are not sufficient. The assumption is only if we had more information, we'd be able to better understand the issue, and this would solve the problem. But more information does not mean consensus. It has meant more division and polarization. It has meant the delegitimation of the public sphere institutions that were really, in the first place, designed to help us negotiate what is real. OK, last paragraph, a socio-technical fortress, freedom of expression, freedom of information, even altogether, including digital literacy, I would say these are insufficient. Even its critical var variances, data science is insufficient. You know. People don't disagree because they're, stu they're stupid. You know, they don't have diverging opinions because they're dumb. Two people look at the same data, and based on it, they can reach entirely different conclusions. So um, this requires not data science or even critical data science, but in my opinion, an understanding of the dark arts and the politics of sorcery, what I call data, D-A-D-A -D -A science, data science. So a reminder all the time of the role of the irrational in rational processes. And it requires building a movement capable of asserting the rational subject, not assuming it. And without building support in political movements, insufficient information isn't ever and probably never will be sufficient for social transformation. Thank you.